pontinho, Lívia. Já estamos no YouTube? Certo. Vamos botar o joinha, tá tudo certo, então tá bom. Olá, gente, bom dia. Queria falar que é uma grande alegria estar aqui hoje nessa manhã do dia 27 do 10. Nós vamos começar agora a segunda sessão de comunicação do Seminário Semiótica da Intrasividade, em celebração ao centenário do pesquisador Yuri Lottman. É, temos aqui hoje as apresentações da sessão 2, Diálogo e Afinidades do Pensamento de Lottman, Contribuições de Lottman para uma Teoria da Comunicação, de Arthur Valberviana, da Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, temos também o um trabalho de Laura Linaski, da Tallinn University, Yuri Slotman's Concepts of Autocommunication in Crip Speech. Temos também o um trabalho de Paulo Moutinho Barroso, Lotman e Bodrilat, da Semiosfera, a Iconolatria da Mediosfera, do Instituto Politécnico de Viseu, Portugal. E temos o um trabalho do colega aqui da USP, Arthur Simon Zanella, a Impresividade de Lotman e o caráter fantástico dos imaginários de ficção científica. I would like to, to greet, uh, also in English, uh, and I would like to say that I'm really, really happy to be here, to be the host, and introducing the table of section two, Dialogues and Affinities of Lotman's Thoughts. We will have uh, four different books here, Contribuição, contribuições de Lótima para uma Teoria da Comunicação, Arthur Valberviana, Univer Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. We have also a speech of Yuri Lotman's Concept of Autocommunication and Crib Speech, uh, a work uh, made for Laura Linassi from Tallinn University. We have also Lotma and Bloodlight da Semiosfera à Iconolatria da Mediosfera, com Paulo Moutinho Barroso, from uh, Polytechnical Institute of Brazil, and, and also our colleague Arthur Simon Zanella, a imprevisibilidade de Lótima e o caráter fantástico dos imaginários de ficção científica. I will control the time, it will be uh, 15 minutes for each one of us to to present, I will interrupt the speech when uh, it's already 10 minutes. I will, I, I will not make a time here. I will uh, say during the, the presentation, so I will have to interrupt. And also when there is one minute left, I will also to interrupt to say we have one more minute to finish the, the presentation. We will do the four presentations and at the end uh, of the, 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 all the presentations. Yes, five, 15 minutes each. And then 10 minutes, I will say you have more five minutes. And then when there's one minute left, uh, I will say again. And then uh, when the four presentations, okay. Okay, I, I think maybe two. I think we have time, okay, uh, 20 minutes. I think that's not a problem. And then uh, after all, we will work for questions here uh, and, the, and also from YouTube, we will check if there are questions here and then the questions for YouTube, okay? So if, if you want, you can make your presentation in Portuguese, there is no problem. And if you want to do it in English, so it's okay too. So we will begin with uh, uh, Contribuições de Lótima para uma Teoria da Comunicação de Arthur Valberviana, Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul. Ok. Dá para ir? Sim. Beleza. Sim. Bom dia. Bom dia, pessoal. Good morning, Lauri. How are you? Are you in Tallinn now? I am in Tallinn, yeah. 
Yeah. Is it cold there? Uh, it is cold and wet. It is a couple of degrees <laughs> above uh, zero, but uh, <laughs> that's the winter nice. here. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll try to do it in English. I'm sorry if it, it's a bit rusty, but let's Thank try. you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, I'll share my screen here. Um, can you see it and hear me well? All right, so again, good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing fine. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for being here. I'm very happy to be participating in such a privileged space of debate. My name is Artur Viana. Um, the work I'm going to present today is titled in the form of a question. Um, what are Lotman's contributions to a theory of communication? So it's an attempt, uh, still very initial, to understand what some of these contributions could be and to think of a way to organize them, to systematize it and produce something from there. Um, this is a bit of what I intend to do within the scope of my doctoral thesis. Briefly, I study with a group of homeless people who produced their own newspaper, which is called Jornal Boca de Rua, and it means mouth of the street, um, something like that. Well, um, my goal is to understand the effects of production, circulation, and consumption of this newspaper, something that I have called deformative processes, or what would be a deformative communication. And I use deform, um, even though it has a pejorative sense of wrong form or a bad form, uh, but I'm interested in thinking in the sense which is expressed in the dictionary, uh, which is to change form or shape. So no negative nor positive value of judgment then. Deforming would be to move from the current state of affairs without guaranteeing the next one, without guaranteeing uh, a priori, what the system will be like or where it will be in the next moment. And, and here I see a very close relationship with the semiotics of culture and with, with Lotman's thought. Though well, it was reading these authors that I built my reasoning around it, so it, it couldn't be different. Um, so um, Lotman throughout his works presents very interesting concepts for us to think about communicative processes. The border as a space of contact between semiotic systems, the translation of cultural texts that move from one system to another, and that are always transformed in this and by this movement, modeled, internalized, incorporated now by a new system. And among these concepts, one seems especially important for us to think about communication, which is tension. Um, for Lotman, tension is constituted in the action of contradictory forces that take place in the contact between systems, that is in the communication between them, both a movement to expand the area uh, of intersection between the systems, aiming to increase the understanding, the understanding of each other, via identity or redundancy, which is the term Lotman will use, but also a force that separates the systems that seeks to reduce the intersection and in this, in this movement add value to the communication carried out between the systems. So tension is precisely in the relationship of these two opposing forces, which act in the transit of text between one system and another, on the one hand, the desire to expand similarity so that there is more understanding. And on the other hand, the desire to increase the value of messages, which means reducing the similarity and the common area between the systems and put talk the non-intersected zones. So it's in the difference there where there's noise, there where communication is more difficult, that's where it has more value. Um, and this vision will oppose central theories in the field of communication that see noise indifference, a problem which can be caused either by misunderstandings between sender and receiver or between systems, we can say, or by techni technical defects that need to be addressed. 
And this will certainly matter for theories of information and computation, which are dependent on direct comments with no ambiguity, that is with maximum intersection. Um, Balatman will show that the communicative process is more complex. He says, um, the value of dialogue is linked not to the part that intersects, but to the transmission of information between the parts that do not intersect. It can be said that the translation of the untranslatable ends up being for the better of information of high value. This part is in uh, culture and explosion. So translation of the untranslatable, precisely this communication between the non-intersecting areas of the systems. And uh, what I'm saying here, it also arises from previous works by Nisia Martins do Rosario, she's my thesis advisor. And from discussions in our research group, which is corporalities, which is part of the research group on semiotics and communication cultures. And Nisia also questions the possibilities of theorizing communication from the Latmanian concept of tension. And she emphasizes the role of the untranslatable in this game of communication, um, the importance of the contact with the outside, with the strange, with texts beyond our cultural borders. Um, that's the importance of the allosemiotic space, this alien cultural system that we do not know how it works, its language. We can't read it very well, read it as we can, we translate it as we can. Um, we relate to these texts according to the modeling capabilities of the systems in which we are inscribed. So to understand this paradox of translating the untranslatable, and to see there in this relationship with what's external, different, outsider, to see there the creative function of sem semiotic systems, to see that from the mixture between systems, we will arise possibilities to learn and to produce new languages, new meanings. Well, um, it seems an interesting beginning of an answer to the question we are asking, you know, um, what are Lotman's contribution, contributions to theory of communication? And we see now a communication that is taken to the outside, exposed to the outside, and that balances itself in this tension between expanding and reducing, reducing the areas of intersection between the systems in dialogue. Um, all right, so I'll move on to a second point of the discussion in which I want to dwell a little while longer on the concept of entropy. Because when you talk about exposure to the outside, this transit of text and an excitement of translation processes, we're really talking about a textual dispersion, a potentially explosive excitement that transforms the systems in contact, in communication. And the concept of deformation that I want to elaborate has everything to do with this change in the composition and in the functioning of science systems throughout the communicative process that it experiences. And in my specific case, the communicative processes carried out by a group of homeless people who make a newspaper and sell it on the streets of Porto Alegre, where I'm from. Um, I'm interested in thinking about entropy because it's a concept that highlights the fact that it's not anything that can be established from all this textual movement. There is a limited number of states that can arise from the contact between the systems X and Y and Z. So changes or even the explosion of new cultural texts do not happen randomly. And entropy helps us understand that. Um, when Lotman talks about entropy, he's in dialogue with the information theory. He points out in structure of the artistic texts that from an informational perspective, Noise is the eruption of disorder, of entropy, the disorganization in the sphere of structure and information. And from this point of view, then entropy is corrosive to structures and even makes the communicative processes impossible. The noise caused by it with, with the insertion of difference in the systems in dialogue. And so the expansion of possibilities of reconfiguration of these systems, it kinds of cancels the information. Um, Belotman will bring more elements to the discussion. He adds, for example, that if, you if we operate only with, within a rigid system of rules, 
in order to contain entropy, to firmly control cultural boundaries, avoiding this injection of different texts, avoiding translations, then every new, new work of art, and he's, he's talking about that, but every new cultural text, we can say, uh, internal to this system would only represent a copy. It would be the same as others made before. So redundancy would suppress entropy and along with it, any informational value, any difference. And here we can see the importance of tension, which works as a regulator of the entropic degree. And I'll talk more about that. But first, I'm going a little further. So entropy is a concept that comes from the laws of therm thermodynamics, from the field of physics then. And it talks about the dispersion of energy in a given system. Uh, in short, entropy is a way of calculating the possible amount of future states that can happen in a system. Um, so the greater the entropy, the greater the number of possible future states for a system to configure um, to a point where it perhaps ceases to constitute itself as a system and dissolves into something else. And that's why entropy is often associated with a measure of disorder or chaos because the more entropy, the greater the possibilities of changing the current state of the system. So the more energy is moving and we can say the more texts are moving in our case. So more entropy then means more unpredictability, but it's not quite the same as chaos or disorder. It's a study of probabilities. Um, I was listening to a podcast where they were discussing entropy and one of the researchers there said something interesting about it that is, preferable to think of the unknown, which I understand as what Lotman calls unpredictable, because disorder or chaos always seems too arbitrary. It is normative because it, it needs to define and regulate a priori, uh, the order, disorder, right, wrong pairs. Um, so what interests us about entropy is to think of it as a study of the potential future states that a system can assume. Um, knowing that there are only certain set of possibilities, future, possible future states that can take place um, from the intersections carried out by each system. Lotman says something in this sense, I quote, each moment of explosion has its set of possibilities of which only one is accomplished. So unpredictability is all the time constrained by the conditions and possibilities of each system uh, this is not what me anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this. <laughs> so unpredictability is all the time constrained by the conditions and possibilities of each system and by the system systems with which it relates to. There is a set of possibilities to which the explosion or any alteration is submitted to. Um, and here we have one more fold that is important to highlight. Not only an entropy shows that it's not anything that can take place in a future moment. It also says that among the possible future states, there are some that are more likely to happen than others. And this is important. So I'm saying first, that entropy level grows as the relationship with text external to the cultural system also grows, which introduces difference to the system. In other words, there are more possibilities for new states to be configured there's more miscegenation, more change. So this incorporation of foreign texts produces changes in the systems, which assumes new forms and new operating logics. It learns and develops new languages until potentially it explodes, deforms, assuming another form that we don't know from where we are now, what it will be. But the point is, it is possible to imagine evaluating the relations of the present not only which features are possible or not, updatable or not, but which are more possible, most likely to happen. Um, what I'm trying to say is how this, what I'm trying to understand is how this introduction of difference in a system based on the relationship between the allosemiotic space generates changes in the functioning of that system and how a system remains one even though it's already order in this movement. And I understand this as a central questions of semiotic or semiotics of culture, how one remains one while being already other. 
So how borders are redrawn, how an interior is kept separated from an exterior, even when these borders um, change places all the time and that translation of new texts are in stock. Sorry, Atul, you have more five minutes, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, this is perhaps the deformation that I'm talking about. This border redesign based on the new languages that are learned, the updating in modeling systems, and the new textual, textual composition that fills that system. And entropy as a probabilistic study is about that. The chances of these new forms happening, if they do. Um, we're talking about the chances of each future state happening, the forms that the new, the unpredictable, can take, for, can take from the clashes between systems, which push each other, sometimes increasing and sometimes decreasing their intersections. And in this movement, as I said a little while ago, tension works as a kind of regulator of the entropic degree, because it regulates the location of the border zone. It regulates the amount of external text that will be in contact being translated. It increases the intersection, increasing the similarity, and sometimes break apart the systems, decreasing the intersection, and thus increasing the conversation between different extrasemiotic, non-intersected texts. Um, I'll try to explain this probabilistic uh, view of entropy with an example. But in short, that's it. It's a statistical thinking that seeks to measure probabilities of future states of affairs happening. And obviously, it's not possible to anticipate whether or not they will actually happen. I mean, it's not guessing or fortune telling. Um, but we propose to think of entropy as a reading of the present machinations of each system to understand what is most likely or not to happen from these relations carry out now. Um, so this is a classic example used to explain this view on entropy. If we throw two six-sided dice up, there is a finite number of possible outcomes, which will always vary between two and 12. The sum will be the macro states, but there are a series of microstates, it's kind of hard to say, what is the difference between macro and microstates? <laughs> anyway, um, but there are a series of microstates that produces these macrostates. For example, for us to have the macrostate three, there are two possible microstates, one and two or two and one in each dice thrown. And to have the macrostate two, there is only one possible microstate, which is one and one. And that is why we can say that the future macro state two is less likely to happen than the future macro state three. Um, in the image there, you can understand a little better these differences in probability between future states and which are more likely to happen. And that's what entropy refers to. And seven is the most likely macro state to happen. Um, so I talk of entropy, not aiming to say in advance uh, if and which semiotic explosions will take place and in what way. What seems interesting to me to learn from this debate is that there is indeed a limited number of things that can happen. It states that are more or less likely to take place based on the conditions of the systems in which one is immersed and the connections made with the outside with other systems. And to conclude then, Lotman states that the parts of the code that do not intersect constitute the zone that deforms, undergoes miscegenation, or is otherwise restructured as it passes from writer to reader. This is also in the structure of the of artistic text. Um, that is, in the passage of text between systems, it is the parts of the code that do not intersect that produce um, differential effects, so to speak that produce deformation, that alter forms without guaranteeing which form will be taken next, that animate entropy and multiply the possibilities of alteration in the future states of science systems. Um, have a one more minute. Now that's it. So I hope the presentation wasn't too long or too boring. 
No. And there's still a lot for me to delve into. But thanks for listening. Um, I've talked too much already, and I'll wait for questions so we can talk a little more. Thanks. Thank you, Arthur. And now we have just one minute. Here is Lotman's concept of how to communication and crib speech with Laura Linaski from Tallinn University. Do you hear me well? Do you see me well? Perfect. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Arthur, for a very clear presentation. It was a pleasure, pleasure to hear it. Uh, and um, actually, I think that in uh, so many ways, uh, what I'm going to present here is going to be perhaps an example of what you just uh, explained in, in practice. Uh, uh, my name is Lauri Linask. I'm a, I'm a lecturer of cultural theory at Tallinn University, and I'm still a PhD student at, uh, at University of Tartu, and my supervisor is uh, Kalevi Gull. Uh, uh, what I'm going to present here is going to be published uh, very soon, so I hope you will forgive me if, uh, if uh, this summary that I'm going to present here, I'm, I'm going to read it for, for uh, simplicity. Uh, so, uh, after Roman Jakobson's famous communication model, autocommunication can be defined as communication in which the addresser and the addressee of a communicative message are the same. All communication may be said to have an autocommunicative aspect to the extent that the sender also perceives the message that it sends out and anticipates its effect. On the other hand, Autocommunication may develop its own specific purposes, in which case it may also become structurally distinct from communication with another. The concept of autocommunication has been widely adopted after Yuri Lotman, but its uh, predecessor were Jakobson's brief discussions of what he called interpersonal communication. In turn, Jakobson relied on Percy's claim that thinking in principle, is carried on in the form of internal dialogue between different phases of the ego, or as a connection with the self's past and future, as Jakobson put the idea, suggesting that while interpersonal communication bridges space, intrapersonal bridges time. Both Jakobson and Lotman also borrowed from Lev Vygotsky's studies on speech and thinking in small children, which gave verbal autocommunication a central role in the development of thinking in early childhood. Jakobson was more concerned with how in autocommunication, instead of transfer of signs from one mind to another, there is transfer of signs from one state of mind to another, as in recalling something with the help of signs. However, next to this uh, mnemonic type autocommunication in universe of the mind, Lotman was more interested in the type in which the addressee really already has all the information that she herself communicates. Such are diaries, internal monologues, and other kinds of text addressed to the utterer or the writer herself, really having in mind no other reader. So this raises the question of the functions that this kind of communication might serve. If the message is already shared before the communicative act, and therefore the purpose of autocommunication cannot be transfer of messages, then what is it? If structures of messages cannot provide for telling anything new, what happens to them? To understand that, it is first important to properly describe this situation. Uh, in Culture and Explosion, Lotman proposes a model of communication in terms of lingual space shared by the speaker and the hearer. Arthur actually already explained it to a large degree, so I, I will be very brief. Uh, Lotman says, in the, normal, in the normal functioning of language, a presupposition is made as to the initial non-identity of speaker and hearer. In these circumstances, an area of intersection in the lingual space between speaker A and hearer B is normally established. In a situation where there is no intersection, communication appears to be impossible, whilst a full intersection with A and B identical renders communication insipid. 
Therefore, there is a full intersection, a full identity in the ideal case of autocommunication, if such was possible, of course. So long as the spaces between the speaker and the hearer overlap only partly, Lotman continues. At the same time, an intersection between two contradictory tendencies appears, what the struggle to facilitate understanding, which will always attempt to extend the area of the intersection, and the struggle to amplify the value of the communication, which is linked to the tendency of maximally amplifying the difference between A and B. Thus, in normal lingual communication, it is necessary to introduce the concept of tension, some form of resistance, which the spaces A and B use to oppose one another. So, what is the value of, of the message if the speaker and hearer are exactly the same, and therefore the lingual space is shared entirely? Lotman explains the way in which new information is added to the message that was expected to be redundant. He says, this is the result of introducing a supplementary second code. The original message is recoded into elements of its structure and thereby acquires features of a new message. He continues, tension arises between the original message and the secondary code, and the effect of this tension is the tendency to interpret the semantic elements of the text as if they were included in the supplementary syntagmatic construction and have thereby acquired new reflationary meanings from this interaction. These are all from universe of the mind. So on the primary level, the message is re redundant in the case of autocommunication, but on the secondary, it becomes significant. In the II system autocommunication, the same message is given a new supplementary value by deflecting from what is said onto the message itself, that it is uttered exactly this way and not another. As a result of this interpretative tension, a communicative effect is inflicted within the utterer as interpreter herself. So Lotman explains, the I she system allows one merely to transmit a constant quantity of information, whereas the I I system qualitatively transforms the information. And this leads to a restructuring of the actual I itself. In this first system, the addresser transmits a message to another person, the addressee, but remains the same in the course of the act. In the second, II system, while communicating with herself, the addresser inwardly reconstructs her essence, since the essence of a personality may be thought of as an individual set of socially significant codes, and this set changes during the act of communication. Consequently, by communicating with the identical self, the main effect is changing the utterer's interpreter's own state of mind. In short, autocommunication serves for self-reorganization, self-regulation. In fact, II system transforms the utterer from a state of being a passive receiver into that of an active interpreter. This way, Lotman also takes the communication model an important step further. When the message is already known, it is the construction of the message, the code that catches the attention and the significance. In effect, calling upon a cognitive change in the utterer interpreter's own thought process. Lotman says, functionally speaking, a text is used as a code and not message when it doesn't add to the information we already have, but it, when it transforms the self-understanding of the person who has endangered the text engendered the text and when it transforms already existing messages into a new system of meanings. As Lotman elaborates, the II system is at the heart of any other repetitive rhythmical activity that has the characteristic of bringing the mind onto the activity itself. This way, the structure of an artistic work often contributes to bringing the focus of the interpreter to its particular form of expression, which in the process acquires significance on its own. So in poetry, autocommunicative effects are often guided by the particular organization of the message by means of the message itself. For example, rhythmically organized phonetic, syllabic, primary level, uh, semantic patterns, and so on. So the supplementary code may be external only heuristically. While Lotman warns against identifying poetry strictly as autocommunicative, autocommunicative effects are characteristic to the poetic principle in general. So autocommunicative auto shifts onto the message itself in the 
in the utra interpreter are necessary for the functioning of both metalingual and poetic messages, which are both characteristically reflective. So what happens to communication when what is being said is really already known? Creep speech is a specific speech genre which takes place as a small ch child's pre-sleep monologue. It occurs between ages one and a half to three, although there is quite a bit of variation. When the child is already in bed, just about to fall asleep, distinctly when feeling alone. So here's there, there's a, an example from Ruth Ware's observation with her son, Anthony, talking to himself. It goes roughly like this. What color? What color blanket? What color mop? What color glass? Creep speech is studied just, has been studied just a few times. Its proper place and functions in the development of thinking in children are still debated. So it is unclear what initiates and insp inspires this kind of uh, speech for the small child. And it is unclear why it brings such joy for the child that practices it. So how to explain its very particular appearance in form and content? And does it have a purpose in the child's thinking? So I will try to answer some of these questions by looking at creep speech as a kind of autocommunicative speech. It is unclear how common creep speech actually is. Only some keys engage in it, and therefore it cannot be necessary for, for, for normal linguistic or cognitive development. It might also vary culturally. As it happens when the child is alone, children must be used to sleeping in a separate room, which is not a common practice in many, if not most cultures. Creep speech has been difficult to observe. When small children communicate with their parents, they mostly strive to be clear and conventional. In speech for oneself, there is no incentive for that, as other uses of speech are more important. So with a lot of mumbling and muffled words, creep speech really first strikes as incoherent or nonsensical or random. Creep speech is functional and structurally close to private speech. This is a term that Lev Vygotsky introduced. As Vygotsky explained, all speech is originally social and derives functionally from speech used as a means of calling for help from a caregiver. Language use then gradually develops as means of reflection for the child herself as it acquires cognitive representational functions, becoming useful also personally. So private speech progressively separates from speech from, for others. Private speech is speech for oneself but in the beginning, it remains vocalized and not too different in appearance from that of conversation with another person. In this respect, private speech is very similar to creep speech. Talking in oneself can often be observed among three to seven, often during social or so solitary play or other activities, which usually involve some sort of, of solving, uh, solving some sort of a task or a puzzle. Creep speech is cut off if somebody comes around. The social setting of a speech event again provides an explanation. Each message uttered in a social setting acquires communicative significance interpersonally, even if unintended. While once the child realizes she is not alone, this interactive dimension breaks into creep speech and the child stops. A speech slowly becomes practically useful because of its social roots. Private speech may actually increase in the presence of others but no interactive outcome is expected from creep speech as there is no need at hand to be solved. So if need actually would arise, the child obviously would vocalize very loud and very clear. As private speech is different, it differentiated from interactive speech functionally, it also comes to change in structure. While in the beginning it resembles interactive speech, by the time it is internalized, it comes to resemble inner speech. According to Lev Vygotsky, it develops in the process idiosyncratic word use and a highly condensed abbreviated elliptical syntax with a tendency towards predicativity with the subject of the utterance removed, which is a very characteristic feature of autocommunicative speech in general, because simply there is no need to tell oneself the subject of the talk. It all renders private speech incomprehensible to others, and the same exactly applies to in creep speech as well. Although both uh, private speech and creep speech are, are uh, speech for oneself, they are also vocalized speech. So why vocalized? The social and contextual nature of early speech again must be kept in mind. 
Each utterance or linguistic sign for the child initially is an integral part of the entire situation of its use. It is the external vocal aspect of the sign which is first associated with the caregiver and the situation at hand. Early sign use is highly particular to the context of its occurrence, both in form and function or expression and content. It takes time before internal abstract word meanings are formed to be used across contexts. Even once thought becomes more independent across the context within which it arises, as to the social nature of communicative speech, the vocal part of the linguistic sign forms with its intellectual part an inseparable unit in which both are carried along. It takes several years before the expression itself is used only in form and verbal thought is separated from its vocalization. And of course, uh, it is not uh, uncommon to see grown-ups talking to themselves um, aloud uh, occasionally. Although creeps talk is liberated from the here and now of the interactive setting, its vocal expression is still tied to the ver verbal thought. Uh, still, uh, the particular structure and functions of creep speech uh, needs to be uh, explained. So uh, vocalization as externalization of thought might itself provide something for the child during creep speech, as long as it is already there. So- Sorry, uh, Laurie. Sorry, yeah. Laurie, you have more five minutes, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, creep speech as a speech genre has a very distinct appearance. It consists of what are not so much single utterances, but strings or sequences of a few words, phrases, clauses, which Ruth Weir called paragraphs and, and Catherine Nelson uh, episodes. So varying from shorter to longer, depending on the child, uh, her linguistic competence, the general talkativeness and the particular mood, uh, uh, these uh, strings appear as structured variations on repetition on a single underlying theme. Uh, within one episode, which thereby acquires a somewhat um, text-like organization, although both the single phrases, which are often elliptic and holophrastic, uh, as I said, and the episodes as wholes are often left um, fragmentary, unfinished and open-ended in both uh, structure and content. Uh, during a session, the central topic sometimes changes and uh, sometimes uh, not. So a typical creep speech uh, appears very much like play, as in the excerpt uh, from these uh, re recordings with Anthony. So I, I uh, explained it a bit before, but, but roughly again, to bring your attention to the structure. So it goes, step on the blanket, where is Anthony's blanket? Where is Anthony's blanket? Where's hiding? Books down, down, have the books today. I take the white blanket off, on the blanket, under the blanket, Sleep, go, what a blue blanket, what the take the blanket. So Lotman suggests that play is a secondary modeling system, which contrasted to the primary level natural language is such a semiotic system with the aid of which models of the world or its fragments are constructed. Lotman recognizes play as a cognitive system in which real life situations and behaviors are learned. While art is just like life, play is just like activity while neither is simply a reproduction, but rather a productive recreation. In play, the modeling system is created by enacting the modeled activity. A real life situation is frozen in time, so that as its real life characteristics are consciously recreated within a simplified structure, their enactment is varied and modified. As a result, the rules of the activity emerge, usually intuitive. This sounds like the correct outcome and this incorrect to be modified. The enactment as such, its variation upon the structure of the activity is what gives play its specific appearance. In this ep episode, play structure can be seen in the paradigmatic alterations within this phrase structure. For Lotman, play is simultaneously double-layered in meaning. The practical play behavior is on the primary level. In creep speech, it is consti constituted by recreation of the daily speech. However, compared to daily speech, uh, it does not denotate, or denotation is not its main task. The referential function is present, but lowered. On the secondary level, that of uh, autocommunication, there is another structure, at least heuristically distinct. It is this imagined, the speak as if. 
In creep speech, it is enactment of the real life speech event for the child herself. So what precisely is recreated or modeled during these enactments of everyday speech events? As autocommunicative play, creep speech very often appears as play with language for which autocommunicative solitude provides the opportunity that would be lacking otherwise. Play-like behavior at the level of sounds has been noted already during creep bubble, suggesting that contrast and coordination of sounds in its vocal aspect might be the earliest form of autocommunicative speech, for which externalized exercise is, well, simply uh, fun. While creep speech is play, it is language practice, although there are major differences between children in what they practice. Sorry? Creeps yeah, one, one minute. more minute. Sorry, it's <laughs> so sad. During creep speech, various linguistic structures are still in formation. It seems, it seems that creep speech is simpler than interactive social context speech, but that might uh, simply because in the simplified play structure, the focus is only on certain aspects of everyday speech and uh, not on other, other uh, uh, aspects. For play, those aspects of language might be most interesting, which are not mastered as yet, also adding to the difficulty of observation. What is important, creep speech structurally appears as playful exercises, taking place either separately or on several structural levels at the same time, from phonemes to the lexical and grammatical. Among repetition, alteration, alternation of structures, including the contrast and antonyms, where finds in Anthony's speech sound play, rhythm, rhyme, alliteration, symmetry of phrases, echo repetition, and many other features, all secondary to the primary level word and phrase meeting. And there is definitely plenty of, of linguistic redundancy. Uh, Lotman's model of autocommunication provides explanation for the composition of these exercises. It is not that the child informs herself of the things she says out loud. In all these cases, the linguistic structure, the difference, the contrast, and also identity of phrases becomes explicit only to the extent that they are uttered out, externalized, and performed. Uh, to, uh, to really uh, finish uh, uh, this, uh, I will jump over some of the some of the uh, uh, topics and, and, uh, and finish with another thought. Uh, creep speech is not just an abstract uh, monologue. Uh, very often it appears as dialogues of imaginary conversations in which the child takes both roles with turn-taking between different conversational voices, usually those of the child and the parents or toys. So here Anthony refers to himself by his own name and it is, appears as if he was taking the part of his mother turning to him. Although it might also be Anthony turning to himself by his name, of course. This is very common in, in uh, uh, ch children's speech of this age. Uh, however, uh, creep speech uh, it does not end with, uh, with uh, enactment of conversations. Catherine Nelson has argued that what I have so far described as secondary autocommunicative modeling can be sometimes, in fact, a narrative in which the child organizes experience of everyday events. At this level, creep speech's textual nature is most clear. Here is there is an example of one of uh, Emily's monologues described by Catherine Nelson. So it goes along, I can't go down the basement with jammers on, I sleep with jammers, okay sleep with jammers, in the night time my only put big girl pants on, but in the morning we put jammers on, but, and the morning gets up of the room, but afternoon, my wake up and play, play with mommy and daddy. So uh, these, uh, uh, the temporal sequences and markers and participants and their activities, event structure, everything should be well recognizable here in this uh, Emily's uh, speak with herself. So Nelson calls it practice in narrative form. Uh, I'm not gonna go in, into them right now or uh, into, the, into the different types that it can take. But uh, to conclude with the last thought, then Nelson is arguing that Emily in this speech is constructing for herself a coherent and comprehensible world in which uh, she is taking her place. Um, this speak uh, supports her interpretation of and activity in the real world. So uh, the narrative analysis uh, uh, here 
is uh, uh, that I just outlined very briefly uh, explains uh, this the purpose of auto communication for Hemily herself. Uh, she describes the world as it uh, it appears for her by enacting through uh, the linguistic activity uh, or everyday linguistic activity for herself. And at the same time, she enacts through um, the situations of her everyday life as they appear to her, constructing the everyday life as it appears to her at the same time. So thank you for your patience. I apologize. I went over time a little bit uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, your questions, if you have any. Thank you, Laurie, for this presentation. I think we have many questions. And now we have, um, I loved both presentations. I think they, they bring lots of questions. And um, now we have um, Lotima e Bodrilat, da Semiosfera, a icono, Iconolatria da Mediasfera, Paulo Moutinho Barroso, do Instituto Politécnico de Viseu, Portugal. Olá, boa tarde novamente. Boa tarde. Estão a ver o meu... Aqui é bom dia ainda, a gente ainda está na manhã. Quantas horas aí? Agora o som parece que deu uma falha. Não sei se foi eu. Pois, olha, eu queria mesmo dizer que desde o início eu estou a receber a transmissão com muitos cortes. Não sei se é da minha internet ou se é do mau tempo que aqui está em Portugal. Ah, sim, entendi. Pronto, então eu vou tentar ser mais, falar menos... Uh, para evitar estes cortes. Estão a ver o diapositivo, não estão? Perfeito, tudo consigo ver e escutar bem. Pronto, então, como, como eu acabei de dizer, então, uh, o, o meu tema, a minha ideia é de abordar, abordar tentar abordar esta, esta permanente transformação e ressemantização da, da, do, do espaço dos signos, e juntamente ao fazer isso também uh, abordar a transformação e a ressemantização dos efeitos dos signos, uh, das mediações, dos meios que transportam os signos e tudo isso. Portanto, uh, esta é a minha preocupação, nomeadamente aqui com alguma problematização, se, uh, 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 enverdar aqui para a questão da, da hiperrealidade das simulações que os signos... Acho que travou também. Então, acesso. Está... Não estão a ouvir? Deu... Agora, agora sim. Agora voltou, deu uma falha na sua internet e agora ela retornou. Isso, sem problemas. Pronto, então eu vou continuar, vou tentar falar menos. E então, a minha, a minha ideia que eu procuro explorar é esta questão da semantização do, do espaço semiótico. Uh, e também a alteração dos efeitos do, da, da própria natureza dos signos nesse mesmo espaço. Portanto, a abordagem é uma abordagem teórico-conceptual no âmbito da semiótica cultural ou da cultura e, 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 e com uma interdisciplinaridade com a sociologia da comunicação. Então, o objetivo é partir do conceito que é o, ma, o que mais me interessa em Lotman, é o conceito de semiosfera, e então uh, transpor esse conceito para o conceito de média esfera e de, agora mais uh, avançado, de uh, S-Sphere. Portanto, o Lotman já tinha referido que, que o espaço semiótico é o espaço dos signos uh, e dos significados. Portanto, há aqui um sentido uh, metafórico do conceito do espaço. Portanto, o espaço, o espaço da semiosfera é, o, é a esfera específica uh, dos signos. Fora deste espaço... Uh, a semiose não, não pode existir, portanto o processo de semiose é permanente, o espaço pode se transformar. Sem a semiosfera a linguagem também não funciona, nem existe, e então a, semio, a semiosfera é o espaço, o pré-requisito que garante o potencial para a semiose, ou seja, 
para a geração de significados, informações, uh, interação linguística e desenvolvimento cultural. Portanto, uh, a semiosfera é, é o espaço semiótico necessário para a existência e funcionamento da linguagem, assim como disse precisamente o Lotman. E no Culture and Explosion, o Lotman tem esta, eu retirei esta citação do, desse, do livro do Lotman, onde ele precisamente vinca esta ideia da heterogeneidade uh, da semiosfera uh, e também a mudança permanente uh, da semiosfera. Portanto, uh, as estruturas semióticas são invariáveis e, e são, uh, 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 desculpem, são variáveis, não podem ser invariáveis. Uh, e, e não podem ser estáveis, porque estruturas semióticas invariáveis e estáveis não existem, é isto que eu quero dizer. E então, um, com base nesta ideia do, do, do Lotman, portanto, a semiosfera é o campo da, da, da propício para a semiose, a semiose é o processo em que os signos operam connosco e vice-versa, a semiose é o reconhecimento e, e a apreensão de algo que funciona como um signo, a semiose, como já tinha dito o Charles Morris, é o processo cognitivo de apreensão e assimilação de algo por meio de um signo. Ora, a minha ideia é que se os signos mudam de estrutura e mudam também a própria estrutura, e então o processo semiose também já não é como um dos modos tradicionais, muda, -se também, muda também. Portanto, eu quero defender aqui este novo, esta nova ideia do novo espaço semiótico, é um espaço híbrido, virtual e real, com interações online e offline, uma existência de uma plétora de, de signos, especificamente dentro do campo dos signos, as, as imagens, e depois referir o facto de, se nós estamos a falar de, do processo de semiose, a plétora dos signos também cumpre aqui uma função uh, uh, distrativa e, aliena, e alienante das próprias imagens sobre a realidade e, e sobre uh, o, a, a sociedade. E então é necessária, como, como partindo do reto que o Lotman anunciou, uma ressemantização permanente e acelerada. Então, uh, eu como não calculava que não tinha muito tempo, eu tenho muitas ideias para transmitir, como calculava que não tinha muito tempo, então eu fiz agora este, enquanto eu estava a ouvir os colegas, eu fiz agora este, esta tabela para sintetizar e, e com ela vou terminar aqui as minhas ideias, portanto, uh, a ideia de, de, de semiosfera que transita para uma média esfera e de uma média esfera que transita para uma esfera. Um, portanto, um, um, a, a média esfera é caracterizada, como eu digo aqui, segundo um, 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 os autores que eu aqui abordo, nomeadamente o Baudrillard, mas também o Eco, a Vitória Campos, ou o John Hartley e outros autores, como um campo mais delimitado do maior campo, que é a, a semiosfera. E então, um, agora existe esta dupla possibilidade do virtual e do real, as interações são online, são offline, como eu estava a dizer há pouco, e depois esta média esfera, é a esfera dominada pelos mídia, não propriamente pelo signo, mas os mídia transmitem os signos, como diz o Baudrillard, é caracterizada pelo virtual e o virtual, por sua vez, é caracterizado por, pela imersão, a imanência e também pelo imediatismo. Então, o Baudrillard é um autor muito, um, pouco, um pouco mais radical, ele remete depois para a irrealidade uh, a que os signos uh, referem e também para a hiperrealidade das simulações, dos simulacros e das simulações. O, o Humberto Eco também aborda esta questão, por exemplo, basta lermos a Viagens na Hiperrealidade Cotidiana, onde ele aborda também esta problemática da construção de um mundo uh, baseado no falso. O exemplo clássico é uh, uh, Disneylandia ou então Las Vegas, onde este esta, esta, predomínio dos signos faz com que nós vivam, vivamos numa, numa ilusão. E então aqui o que mais me interessa agora é uh, esta ideia de Esfia, que é uma nova, uma nova semiosfera uh, online, ressemantizada, de interatividade e globalidade, uma forma de compreensão e leitura 
da realidade como se fosse apenas um cérebro coletivo e fazer aqui esta distinção porque a ideia de Sfia é uma espécie de aldeia global do McLuhan. Só que a aldeia global do McLuhan, que já tem esta ideia, já tem mais do que 60 anos, a, aldeia, a ideia da aldeia global do McLuhan pautava-se pelo panóptico, ou seja, a transmissão via satélite de signos em programas para todo o mundo. Mas agora não, agora a Sfia não é uh, caracterizada pelo panóptico, mas é caracterizada pelo sinóptico, por uma, uma, um consumo mais uh, individualizado dos signos, uh, que ao contrário do panóptico, quando havia poucos a seguir muitos, aqui é o contrário, uh, muitos a seguir poucos, uh, que é exatamente a diferença do, do, do panóptico. Bem, eu não sei se tenho tempo para continuar, tenho? Então pronto, eu tinha feito, aquela, eu tinha feito aquela, aquela tabela para não continuar mais. Então hum, vou continuar, pronto, eu já tinha falado aqui na média esfera, também faço aqui uma referência ao Nicholas Luhmann, que na improbabilidade da comunicação, ele também refere a este aspecto da, do, do facto de sem comunicação não pode haver relações humanas e na verdade não pode haver vida humana, o Nicholas Uman já tinha falado nesta ideia da sistémica da comunicação, a sociedade em rede, a sociedade como um sistema onde o elemento mais determinante para o funcionamento desse sistema serem as formas de comunicação ou se quiserem mais concretamente os signos. E então a média esfera é uma esfera renovada com importância permanente, uma camada, uma camada, uma camada nova e por ter uma camada nova. Então exige uma nova semantização. Eu vou voltar aqui à tabela que eu esqueci de mencionar aqui num ecrã. Eu tenho aqui alguns obstáculos na visualização. Eu queria vos voltar aqui à tabela para dizer que o campo da semiose está presente quer na semiosfera, quer na Porque agora temos uma maior plétula, diga. É, tinha interrompido, mas já voltou a sua, sua conexão. Ok, pronto. E então, uh, o que eu quero dizer é que um, a, a, a minha ideia, a ideia que eu quero transmitir e partilhar é exatamente a ideia de, primeiro, há uma linha de continuidade, uma entre uh, uh, o Lotman, quando surgiu uh, nos anos 80, com este, este conceito de semiosfera, uh, para caracterizar todo o, todo o universo cultural e do, do, dos signos, ele próprio já tinha falado na, numa característica de permanente mudança de, de, desse espaço dos signos, portanto já tinha aberto o campo para que houvesse evolução e transformação do espaço. Depois, esta média esfera também já está uh, muito discutida, nomeadamente com o Gautreá, o e, uh, Berto E. Com licença, Paulo. Ser... Paulo, deixa... na hora que você estava explicando, a, a mediasfera é, interrompeu, é, travou. Se você puder voltar um pouquinho... Pronto, eu estava a dizer então que o que há de comum nestes três, nestas três esferas ou três concepções de, de esfera dos signos, ou campo dos signos, ou campo da semiótica, é a, a existência, obviamente, de signos e aquilo que eles possibilitam ou obrigam, que é o processo de semiose. Não deixa de haver o processo de semiose. O que, deixa de, o, que, o que se transforma é a natureza da estrutura, a complexidade e, obviamente, também a, a, a natureza da, do processo de semiose, que, com signos virtuais, é diferente de, de uma cultura que não seja eletrónica nem virtual, como a cultura de há 40 anos, por exemplo, em que não vivíamos completamente no virtual e, os, e, e continuávamos com a presença de signos, 
e estas transformações todas, então, alteram completamente a nossa relação com os signos e fazem-nos com que nós tenhamos que ressemantizar completamente a realidade de, com a qual nós utilizamos os signos. Bem, eu vou mesmo terminar, espero ter sido claro, a ideia fundamental, como eu disse, é esta ideia de ressemantização do espaço da semiótica e, por outro lado, uma continuação, não é ruptura, uma continuação do, do, das esferas. Obrigado. Muito obrigada. É... Vamos lá, agora a gente tem a última apresentação. A imprevisibilidade de Lótima e o caráter fantástico dos imaginários de ficção científica. Arthur Zanella, da Universidade de São Paulo. Obrigado, Lívia. Uh, well, uh, greetings, my friends, all colleagues here today. And I'm already very grateful for the opportunity to share part of my research related to semiotics of culture and to Yuri Lautman in this conference in his honor. It is a great honor. Uh, I apologize in advance if I sleep any time in my English, but I believe that even so, uh, this research will be more accessible to everyone if I transmit it in English. Hmm? Uh, some roosters <laughs> may crawl here as I'm in a rural area at the moment, rest assured they are very friendly too. Hmm? Uh, well, let's go. The this, uh, research title is Lotman's Unpredictability and Fantastic Character of Science Fiction Imaginaries. During the last decades, we live in periods that can be considered a historical transition between different forms of social reality, often resonant of complex scientific and technological transformations that affect the way we live today. Therefore, it is understood that the study of these transformations from different theoretical perspectives is of distinct and urgent value for the understanding of at least some minimal definitions of culture and communicational parameters that are deniable in an apparent emerging chaos around the exponential growth of visibility and presentation of multiple cultural texts in a progressively mixed setting. Among the... Sorry, Arthur, Arthur just oh, one sorry. moment. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, it's just to check if you are not sharing anything, right? No, I'm not sharing. Okay, just to check because yesterday we had a problem here. No, no. So, so that's okay. Thank you. No problem. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so uh, among the countless possibilities of approaching the current social environment uh, whose transformative potential of communication science and technology covers a broad spectrum to the point of reaching from the individual worldview uh, to the dynamics of international relations, we have the semiotics of culture, which although not being among the most recurrent fields of study in this sense, uh, it can provide a very fruitful look, if we thought, through the, its dialogic viability between particular sign movements and cultural uh, mutations of much greater proportions. Uh, the Russian Estonian semiotician, literary scholar, and cultural historian, Yuri Lotman, offers in particular timely mechanisms within the investigation of the genesis and mutation of cultural texts through the comparative model of languages and semiotic systems for the observation of these movements of culture that can even historically mark the course of a particular social, social group or even the entire civilization. In his work, the predictable workings of culture, Lotman delves even further into concepts that he had already directly or indirectly probed and that can be explored with wide relevance in 
the study of social communication dynamics from the beginning of the century, such as ideas of cultural explosion and unpredictability. In order to work with both concepts of explosion and unpredictability, it is remarkable that Lotman resorts mainly to the reasoning that in addition to the recent cultural ubiquity of science and technology in much of the contemporary world, there is a uniqueness between them that prevents the isolated analysis of either one. Surely such uniqueness is not a relation of semantic uh, mirroring, but an affluence of opposites that have different attributions in the cultural dynamics in which technology outlines more gradual conditions of transformation, while science by nature is related to explosive uh, movements, considering the chronological detachment presenting all its revolutions and discoveries so far. Within this context in which science and technology drives a significant fraction of cultural displacements for the study of explosions and unpredictability, it's convenient for that for the very parameters of predictability predictability, understanding it as projections of future time that mark the, the abrupt and extraordinary, we also investigate this exercise that until now is restricted to imaginative field. Science and technology have not yet reached the means within their own paradigms based on reason and clear evidence to that document future time. Uh, in line with Lotman's argument, it will be through art that the imagination about the future time will create cultural roots, materializing itself with literary, visual, and audiovisual, etc. Holding all the potential of a cultural explosion is precisely art. In this sense, in search of predictability markers in the future projection, uh, materialized by art, we found a particular kind of narrative expression that was consolidated, consolidated as science fiction. And today uh, can be read as an imaginary complex in itself, if, if read as a network. The connective and sedimentary structure of the text is somehow cohesive and recognizable composed of signs common to a universe that can be mapped by recurrence of ideas related precisely to future projections, structured in science and technological transformations and their cultural reverberations. From the visions of Hughes Verne, Mary Shelley, and A.G. Wells, science fiction has not only helped define and shape the course of literature, but has reached far beyond fiction realms to influence our perspectives on culture, science, and technology. The position that Lotman builds between these last two largely underpins the whole notion of science fiction, insofar as the narrative discourse almost always goes through an explosion of scientific origin that gives rise to a dystopian process that can be sustained indefinitely by technological stability. And on the other hand, explosions of artistic social origin are recurrent promoters of the disruption of this same stability in science fiction. Our cultural relationship with science fiction, which became more palpable from the 19th century onwards, materialize with unparalleled excellence the practical relations of explosion and unpredictably in the triad of art, science, and technology, especially when breaking with demarcations of fields of study and professional practice, demonstrating how explosions oriented towards science can be easily coming from artistic, artistic terrains. Just look at how ideas such as electric cars, space travel, and advanced forms of communication comparable to today's uh, cell phones, smartphones, came to public consciousness 
long beforehand through science fiction. Elaborations like these are the basis for one of the characteristic feelings of science fiction, the feeling of wonder or admiration, generally aimed at a scientific feat as a kind of awakening or expansion of consciousness, generating an undeniable connection between what can be considered grotesque or sublime. In this way, what science fiction can reveal through the very elements that lead to unpredictably not in Lottman's view is that under the narrative aspect fundamental for any cultural constitution, it can itself be translated as the fantastic, fantastic character of a work. Even the author himself mentions the fantastic expression when he seeks to express the antagonist universe to the everyday and regular that can erupt as an unpredictable change. The fantastic can refer to an almost immeasurable range of meanings if we can consider the specifics that it will bring to the most subject, subjective viable sense. From an, an, adjective, an adjective for narrative and or artistic works based on fantasy, something conceived, conceived or apparently conceived by an unbridled imagined process or effect so extreme that it, it defies the belief that it is real to something excessively large, great, or marked by eccentricity. The fantastic passes through as many ideas as the absurd, the bizarre, crazy, fanciful, silly, insane, meaningless, absurd, unreal, and wild. In literary terms, the fantastic was consolidated as a jar from the structuralist approach, such as the work of the Bulgarian French structuralist Victor Kritik, Svetan Todorov, who based his conceptualization on the hesitation of characters and readers in the face of questions about their realities. However, when we align the fantastic with Lotman's unpredictability and double increment becomes viable. The, the fantastic is constituted around the unpredictable event which expands the universe of fantastic art beyond the rich and hierarchical conditions designed by the structuralists and, they, and that they often exclude science fiction itself while cultural unpredictability seen from the perspective of the fantastic can illuminate both the emotional, subjective, and ontological character involved in the unpredictable moment, as well as the propensity to search for these same conditions throughout human history. In addition, we know that uh, what escapes the classic definitions of fantastic literature can be precisely uh, beyond what is is constructed by narratives, that it's uh, the space outside the work to which the conception of reality is transported that creates the fantastic effect. Lotman provides an, an example of the inexpressibility typical of romantic literature when it seeks to express the fantastic event, but inevitably it, it, ends, up, it ends up colliding with numerous rhetorical descriptions. In contrast, according to him, the real impact of the unpredictable is the inexpressibility of fact, the silence itself. If both the narrative work and the interlocutor everyday reality follow their course independently of him, it is to be assumed that the silence remains anywhere but in his own mind. Thus, the most pressing ambivalence resides in the pre-existence of these ingredients that view the fantastic in the individual and social mind, despite precisely conceiving the unreal, which is turn is not the unimaginable as something that escapes any chance of mental constitution. 
in this concept uh, that stands out uh, is the conclusion that the vacuum world simply be unfeasible as part of the fantastic equation. When faced with intangibility and some thresholds of reality, it's not mere emptiness that remains. The doors of imagination are opened. Restructuring and modeling reality, it is capable of organically gathering itself into community and metaphoric pockets of memories whose unifying elements reach ideas and also idealizers in this cyclical process between explosions and stabilities that is maintained dialogically as pointed out by lot. Well, uh, that's it, my friends. Possible questions about my presentation can be asked both in English and in Portuguese, but at, at the moment we will only answer in Portuguese, okay? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Um, Paulo Barroso said, uh, said me that he needed to leave, so he left. And now we can make questions and talk about our research, our presentation. I have a question. Arthur Vian, I think, has a question. Can we take too. a five minute break? I really need to go to the bathroom. I, I think, okay, of course. <laughs> Don't worry. So, right, so five minutes. So I think we can take a break five minutes, okay? And All then right, as we have time until until uh, I think 12, that's that's not a problem. João, só para avisar que a gente... Ah, tá, você já viu aí, que a gente não encerrou, a gente só deu uma pausa para depois voltar, tá? Beleza, ali. Olha aí, eu estou com áudio <risos> livre transmitido para o YouTube.
Nice, we're back now. So I think now we have a time for questions. And then uh, I will check on YouTube if there will appear questions too. I have a question. I don't know if you, you want to, to, you can type on the chat in Zoom thread or um, uh, say the question on your, just to, on your speak, if you want. I think we have three common issues here. We have entropy and also auto communication and creep speech and sci-fi. What, uh, what this session makes me think is how uh, unpredictable and also explosion are in this three different presentation, how uh, entropy, auto communication, and also sci-fi are places to, to break up the ordinary ways of the, the meanings and create new meaning and also create art. So my, my first question, I have a question for Lauri and um, just a thought for Arthur. Uh, my question is, I study theater and uh, now I'm studying theater and in theater we have a kind of methodology called improvisation where we let everything that's coming to your mind to 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 bring to the to the to the talk to the speech without thinking a lot just to, to try come the image of a dream is like improvisation through a monologue and then you mentioned about diaries as a kind of possible auto communication and both auto communication and also entropy were uh, themes of study from Alexei yesterday, he mentioned both, uh, both themes of research. And I was thinking how auto communication could be uh, a character to help uh, explosion in art. How can we develop the auto communication as a communication, um, not enough consciousness, but also something related to creation in artist uh, uh, experimentation. If there is a way of there is a, a research about it and send a hug to Kalef Kool. I had the opportunity to meet him once. He's a very nice person. And for Arthur Zanella, uh, yesterday also in Alexei's speech, he mentioned that the past is an ever-changing matter. I keep thinking how sci-fi and the thought of the future is also an ever-changing matter. How to think about the future, even if it, ha it hasn't happened yet, it's also a way of generate an uh, explosion and unpredict unpredictability as you, you mentioned, art is uh, one of the most common way to generate explosion. So, so how the future could be this ever changing matter that hasn't come, but it's also a creation because the future is necessarily a creation and how Safai could make this kind of explosion even bigger. So if anyone has a question, um, you can make it or type it. I also have questions for Arthur and Lauri. Um, maybe I can make them now and then you can answer both questions for me and Livia, because I think they're very similar. Um, so first to Lauri, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought it was quite interesting to think of uh, the movement of this intersected and non-intersected areas of a system. I mean, managing the known and the unknown codes, um, looking at children playing and learning and exercising language and reading and writing in a way 
the world, world around them. Um, but I was wondering, since you said it's very difficult to observe crib speech, um, is there any methodological approach being developed in that way? As it's a very private, a family moment usually, um, how does, how do, or does, these authors you brought on your presentation, how, how do they do that? So it's a very uh, methodological question. And to Artur Zanella, um, very similar to what Livia asked, you talked about how art has this aspect of imagining the future and science fiction has a lot of that aspect. Um, but imagining, we can say, is an act of the present. We imagined, we imagine here about the future. So imagine futures, they expose in a way the structure and the functioning of the cultural systems in the present. Um, but my question to you is, um, what could be um, the influence that this imagined future have on what actually takes place? Something like, um, what will happen? Is it connected to what we can imagine will happen? So that, that's the question. Maybe I will I will start then, or I will take the the to uh, keep it brief. And uh, uh, I I uh, found that uh, what I was trying to express was really indeed very similar to what uh, both Arthur's were saying in 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 their ways. I don't know if you if you felt the same. Um, I found that uh, the way Arthur Viana modeled this kind of entropy in the context of, uh, of communication models was exactly what happened with it in this uh, creep speech. And uh, likewise, it has very particular genre features that come out in this creative explosion in some sense, very similar to what happens or what seems to happen in science fiction. The genre characteristics are different, but actually the mechanism is, uh, is uh, very similar, I feel, in, in such a variety of, uh, of uh, ways. Uh, so uh, to try to answer these questions, I see creep speech as a kind of art. It's uh, Lotman has this fine balance between play and art, but I think that basically it is, uh, uh, in terms of these two-year-olds, it is uh, art or art and play and differentiate from, from each other. And indeed, there is something that is conditioned by, uh, by the situation. And uh, then there is uh, some creativity in terms of, of what is possible there. And in terms of these possibilities, then something new appears that basically for the child explains the world as she sees. I didn't go into this narrative structure much, but actually, uh, the child uses creep speech to predict future activities as well uh, in, the, in this creep speech, which is uh, kind of a wonderful analogy um, as well. Uh, it's interesting that this uh, uh, in, in theater, there are these terms like soliloquy and monologue. And uh, usually monologues uh, or often they are used so as to describe those psychological changes that take place in the character. And, uh, and again, I find this, uh, actually Lev Vygotsky had this famous book called Psychology of Art, where he analyzed uh, Hamlet. And he basically uh, said a lot of the similar things as I, uh, I tried to find in this uh, in this uh, creep speech as well, so it brings on the change in in the in the person who speaks, and uh, and at the same time the speak the the, the uh, language acquires this particular characteristics that I tried to outline, and to to Arthur's uh, comment. The observation of creep speech is really tricky. Actually, children speak to themselves all the time, but it's difficult to catch it. And then when you put, usually then microphones are used. And uh, then 
the researcher together with the parents tries to transcribe them. And most of the speech is incomprehensible, even at best try. Most of it goes to waste. And the second problem is that there is a huge, huge amount of data and it's difficult to pick what is valuable from it and what uh, not. So that's why the reason why there are just a small number of, of uh, observations. Um, I, I guess I will I will have give over the word uh, to you then. Well, this thanks. Okay. Um, so let's say I will respond to Lívia, Xará, Arthur falaram, né? São, são questionamentos que a gente se depara, né? E eu, foi, o começo da pesquisa foi justamente esse, né? Ver como o que o Lotman chama de imprevisibilidade é muito parecido com o que outros autores, especialmente o Roas, está chamando de fantástico. E o fantástico talvez seja o elemento que conecte tudo isso que vocês comentaram né? e a ficção científica com, com a questão das explosões e da arte em si né? o que, que eu quero dizer com isso né? como eu comentei muito do que ele fala de imprevisibilidade é aquilo que realmente não dá para se imaginar não dá para principalmente descrever e aí que se encontra muito do fantástico. Né? É, poxa, como é que eu vou descrever algo no futuro? Não, não tem, é, na verdade, é uma criação, como vocês mesmos disseram, do presente. Né? Não tem como a gente estar no futuro. A gente pode ter infinitas possibilidades, muito além da nossa própria imaginação no futuro. Né? Então, é, o mais interessante é ver que eles coexistem. É, tanto essa imaginação a respeito do, do futuro, né, quanto o futuro em si. É, é interessante notar o, a, a influência. Ela existe, sim. Né, o Arthur perguntou. É, a gente pode notar, né, principalmente é, filmes, é, quadrinhos, a literatura de ficção científica, muito do que a gente percebeu que acontecia lá, sei lá, Há 30, 40 anos atrás, hoje a gente tem, né, principalmente em relação à tecnologia, o que é outro ponto de convergência com os textos do Lótimo, né? essa paridade entre a arte e tecnologia, por isso que a gente pode se apropriar muito bem da, da ficção científica, né? porque através da arte a gente consegue ao menos se aproximar do que poderia ser alguma tecnologia, Agora, o, a pergunta que não quer calar, né, é porque a gente não vai ter uma resposta, é a seguinte, uh, se a gente não tivesse esses instrumentos de arte, né, essas criações artísticas, o futuro seria diferente? Ou, no caso, o nosso presente seria diferente? Né? Aquilo que a gente imaginou através da literatura, dos filmes, uh, influenciou o que a gente criou, até que ponto? É, também é uma outra pergunta que não dá para se responder. É, a gente dá para responder que influencia, sim. Né? Agora, dizer que o, o presente, o futuro, seria diferente sem essa imaginação, é, aí não dá para a gente saber né, o quanto que seria. Então, também é, é uma área que está nessa parte fantástica, que a gente poderia é, ficar pensando por muitos e muitos anos e nunca chegaria a uma conclusão. É. O mais importante que eu acho é considerar que, é, como eu disse no final, não existe o acho, né? acredito eu, não existiria esse vácuo é, do fantástico como aquilo que não pode ser imaginado, pelo menos não por nós, seres humanos. Né? A gente não é, <risos> é meio engraçado, a gente não seria capaz de imaginar o inimaginável. Né? Esse que seria o grande paradoxo do, do Fantástico, mas acredito que seja mais ou menos por aí, né? uma área realmente a se estudar, é uma, uma comparação que comecei agora e que acho que tem, tem um grande futuro né? a, a se pesquisar.
Eu espero que eu tenha respondido. Eu não, eu não tenha deixado mais confuso ainda. Não, não, tá, explicou certinho, tranquilo. Uh, so we have a question here to Arthur Viana from Laura Linaski. Often, if not always, it's very difficult to determine during a moment of explosion the set of permutations, dispositions, possibilities that a situation can form. Do you think that dividing the analysis into macro and micro levels, as you did, can provide as a practical tool to determine the set? Or is the set of possibilities indeterminate by definition? Está tá aqui no Zoom, no, no chat do Zoom. Um, thank you, Laurie. Difficult one. I think when we observe social phenomena is much more complex than two dices thrown to the air, uh, six-sided. So you can see what is more likely to happen. So I think it is undeterminate in a way that it's too many things that can happen. So when I talk of entropy, it's more in a sense to know that it's not anything. I, I won't know what are the things that can happen but I know that it's not anything. It's kind of, um, it is undetermined in that way, in that sense. Uh, it's too complex to say this or that's more or less likely, but there are things that are more and less likely. That's what interests me in entropy. Um, we were talking yesterday, Nisa was also at her um, meeting table. I don't know if you say table in English. <laughs> um, that maybe we can kind of predict when an explosion is going to happen, when you can notice that there's this excitement of translation and things are moving fast, entropia is increasing, but you can never know the, the, the results, the end result of that. The, I mean, you can kind of predict the explosion, but not the effects of the explosion. Um, so thinking entropy in the way that I, I'm trying to think is to know that even knowing that we are not able to predict the, the, the effect of the explosion, we can kind of understand that things are more or less likely to happen with the mixture of system that you have there in that, um, in that moment. I don't know if I answered too well, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank thank you. I think that uh, there is an answer in there, right? I guess uh, uh, with this explosion, there is always this question that uh, uh, explosion uh, from whose point of view? That from the point of view of the observer or from the point of view of the one who participates, that if you're in it, it perhaps uh, makes sense in one way and uh, and if 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 you look at it from the side in in totally other ways yeah so now i'll check on, on youtube no question so is that okay so okay. thank Thank you for, for this section of communication. That's really nice to be here. We still have uh, one third uh, uh, communication today during the afternoon. And also the, the, the other things that are happening on this event to celebrate Lotman's life on the seminar. Thank you. So I would yes, just want to ask to, to put the email on the Zoom chat. So yeah. I would like to keep this conversation with you later. Thank you. Have a nice day. Have a good event. Thank you. Thank nice you very much. You all. Thank you. Thank See you, you around. Bye.
Bye bye. See you. See you. Bye.